I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We'll talk about the new North by North International Film Festival coming to Duluth next week, the latest offshoot of the region's growing film industry. We will preview WDSE's new digital series, Minnesota Historia, and meet the show's producer and host. And Northern Minnesota writer Aaron Brown is our guest on Voices of the Region. These stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, our show tonight has a heavy focus on the arts and history. There's a lot going on here in, uh, in Duluth. It's hard to believe that so many films are being talked about, some are being made here. It's an exciting show. It should be an yeah. exciting show, mm -hmm. but a sad story to begin this week's headlines. Yeah, that's for sure, Julie. Indeed, it was a tragic week as four members of an East Hillside family were killed on Wednesday in what police say was a murder-suicide. Police say Brandon Taylor Cole Skogstead took his own life after shooting all four members of the Berry family while they were asleep in their home. Duluth police were responding to a report of a person suffering a mental health crisis when they found the bodies. Our thoughts and prayers are with the relatives and friends of the Berry family. UW Superior's Lake Superior Research Institute has received nearly $8 million in federal funding to further its work to eliminate aquatic nuisance species. The money will continue research to combat species that enter the Great Lakes through ballast water discharge in commercial ships. The Lake Superior Research Institute was created in 1967. There's sad news from the Lake Superior Zoo in Duluth this week as they reported the death of Leo, their African lion. Leo was 14 and a half years old, and he died from an autoimmune disease. The average lifespan of a lion in the wild is 10 years. And today, Friday, April 22nd, is Earth Day, founded in 1970 by Wisconsin's Gaylord Nelson to raise awareness about air and water pollution. Today, Earth Day is celebrated around the planet in stewardship and celebration of the natural environment. The Earth Day movement is credited for the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the federal Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. The first North by North International Film Festival begins next week in Duluth, and filmmakers from all over are traveling to see their films on the big screen. But one local production doesn't have too far to go. The film, Beyond the North Woods, is a local film, premiering this year with an all-local cast and crew. Producer Megan McGarvey went to the location where the film was shot to find out what is Beyond the North Woods. I am so excited for May 1st when I get to see Beyond the Northwoods. Beyond the Northwoods. Beyond the Northwoods is a found footage horror movie uh, about a YouTuber who comes to town and he wants to go into the woods and film a video about several disappearances that have happened recently. To me, it's a movie about uh, what if the Blair Witch Project were made today. It wouldn't be about film students, it would be about content creators. They wouldn't be shooting with film, they would be shooting on an iPhone. So, so to me, this is the modern found footage movie. Look at that. This movie revolves around what's called a MacGuffin, which is there is a mysterious force sort of driving the plot. And I spent a lot of time early on really trying to establish what was the horror, what was the monster, what was actually terrorizing them. And once we got into editing, I realized that was maybe the least important part of the movie, and it became much more about the people and the characters and sort of watching them become tormented. And, and it became, I thought it was much scarier to, to sort of take these inspirations from like uh, Mothmen or like uh, cryptids or like Bigfoots and sort of use inspiration from them, use sort of the sounds and images we're used to hearing when we encounter them, but never directly say what it is. A lot of us know this area so well that you'll be like, oh, that's Lester Park. Oh, that's Anger Tower. I know where these places are. It makes it feel more real. Um, and it's like, oh, could there be something in our woods, in our home that is simply unknown? I think this park does lend itself to horror. It's, it's, it's a little creepy at night. And that, that was kind of 
why uh, everything was shot here in, in that way. Um, it's, it's very easy to access too, and it's all these amazing trails. Uh, there's, there's just so, so much great scenery, and there's bridges, and there's waterfalls, and there's, there's just a lot of fun stuff to see out here. Um, that yes, you can carry a film just shooting out in one location like this. The last movie I made before this was a solo project. I spent a year by myself in the woods and I, I kind of in general spent a year by myself. So it, I felt it was really important for me to, to get working with people again and to, uh, and to get a group going again so we can start working on more things as the world begins to open up. We have just a plethora of talent and drive in the area and so to not make use of that seems like a huge waste. And also this is a Duluth project, it's shot in Duluth, um, it's shot on the trails, we're out here at night. It's a little scary, you need people who are used to that, you need people who know the area, who aren't afraid to come out here, it was kind of a necessity, we needed people who weren't afraid to come into the woods at night and if they did get afraid it, it helped their acting a little bit. I've lived here for over 20 years so I've personally seen just a ton of growth with all these new film festivals and like all these other ways that people are able to share their work just collaborate and actually just be a full arts community that's not really kind of segregated to just oh they're just theater people oh they're just film people. There's been this crazy big mix I feel in the past like five years even of all of the different arts communities coming together and like collaborating working together making art because that's the baseline of it is like we want to make art and we want to be in the place where we love which is Duluth. It, it's just a great little community uh, so just by word of mouth like I've been able to be in a bunch of projects throughout the years. I am so excited for May 1st when I get to see Beyond the Northwoods at the North by North International Film Fest and to be with my fellow filmmakers and actors and the audience ready to see and be together again. It's really important that there are local institutions and local festivals that are focusing in on community-made art and, and making an excuse to, to show it and to bring everyone together. And I think the growth here has just really kind of opened a lot of doors for people and is continuing continuing to open a lot of doors um, for all these artists here. So, and I mean, I love it here. So why would I leave if everything that I've been working towards is coming right over here? It's, it's, a, really, it's a really cool place to be right now. Where are we? We're, we're in the Northwoods right now. Welcome to the Northwoods. Uh, I hope you like your stay because there will be more of the Northwoods. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. Beyond the North Woods premieres May 1st at the North by North International Film Festival. Well, here to talk more about the festival is Kelly Florence, one of the film festival programmers. Sarah Luke is the communication and communications and creative director at Zeitgeist, which is hosting the film festival. And Lynn Williams is the marketing and public relations officer for UMD, one of the festival sponsors. And thanks to all of you for being here. Exciting to have a, a, a new film festival here in town. Sarah, maybe you can tell us what makes this one unique and different from the other film and content festivals that people have come to know in Duluth. Yeah, absolutely. So North by North, we're really a community-based um, arts program, and um, we partner with a lot of different community organizations um, from the Duluth branch of the NAACP to the Twin Ports, Asian Pacific Islander Desi Collective, um, the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, um, um, ACO obviously has been a big supporter and really our focus is on community storytelling and providing opportunities to, to local creators, filmmakers to intersect with um, a national and international audience as well. Mm -hmm. Kelly, tell us about the North by North pitch competition. What's that all about? So filmmakers get to pitch their ideas to a panel of judges and they're getting put up in town and um, supported with resources. They're going to get feedback live after they pitch and they're actually going to get funding scholarships to make their projects. Mm -hmm. Lynn, from a sponsor's standpoint and from UMD's standpoint, 
Why is it important to support this kind of uh, a, a new festival and growth of this industry in the community? Yeah, good question. UMD has strategic priorities around uh, creative activity as well as pivotal community partnerships. And this is a way to bring both of those together. As well, we know that our students want hands-on experiences in film and TV and video production. It's a pathway for them, and it's great to be able to offer that same pathway for other community members. Mm -hmm. uh, you were involved in, in helping to, to pick some of the, the films that are going to be in the festival. Were there a lot of uh, submissions and how did that process work itself out? Oh, there's so many great submissions and if we could program them all we would, but we would be here for two weeks so we can't. Uh, I think it was really important to lift up underrepresented voices and people in communities that maybe aren't normally heard and their films haven't been seen and so there's going to be things that make you laugh, things that make you cry, things that make you think and, and as we saw in that um, uh, the little clip there are things that scare you. <laughs> Sarah, how much independent filmmaking is done in Duluth or at least in this region? You know, I think there's there's a fair amount of filmmaking that's happening and just the creative economy in Duluth, it's a really exciting time to be in the Northland um, from an arts perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is UMD adding uh, more majors or more programming to, to try to tap into that creative culture and the, the filmmaking industry that's starting to develop around here? Yeah, it's really exciting and we're finding ways to make those connections both through Zeitgeist and other efforts in town. It's a wonderful way to supplement and add some additional opportunities to their academic experience. It's a new partnership for us and we're getting off the ground. It's really exciting to think about where it could go down the road. Lynn, how difficult is it for independent filmmakers to get their work shown in local theaters? Yeah, well, these two probably actually know more about okay. that than I do, so sure. maybe I'll defer that if I could. Well, I think it's it's maybe it's difficult, and and um, this is a great way to get an audience, a built-in audience. So you could show a film, but only get your friends to come. But here, you're going to have filmmakers from all over the world come mm -hmm. and see it as well. Sarah, we saw a snippet of uh, a horror piece. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other genres that people can can see at the film festival? Give just a little bit of a sampling of what people might experience. Yeah, and again, Kelly could probably speak to this more. <laughs> sure. Um, there's a little bit of everything. There's okay. some documentaries, there's drama, comedy, there's even family friendly blocks. And so I think it's really important to look at the schedule and see that, hey, we could bring the whole family out um, for an afternoon on Saturday and, and see some films. Mm -hmm. And will all of the films be screened at Zeitgeist or are there going to be multiple venues around the community? They will all be screened at Zeitgeist. We're very excited. The full building, so both <laughs> of our movie theaters down t downstairs and then our theatre performing arts theatre upstairs um, will have panel discussions we'll have mixers and after parties and opportunities for folks to network and, and just great. real quickly yeah. people who want to participate where do they get the badges where do they sign up yeah great question go to zeitgeistarts.com or northbynorthfest.com and you'll have an opportunity to purchase your badge all right Good. thank you so much for coming in and thank sharing you the information. all very much thanks, thanks for having it. us good luck thanks. thank you thanks It's time now for our weekly segment, Voices of the Region. It's an opportunity to learn about some of the stories being covered by journalists in our region. This week, our guest is author and columnist Aaron Brown from Itasca County. You can look back to the 80s and you know, when cars, uh, manufacturing cars became much more automated or even locally in the taconite industry, when the trucks got bigger and the shovels got bigger, uh, you looked at a lot of people losing their jobs who used to work with, you know, spades down on the ground. Well, um, this has continued to the point where I point out in the piece that, you know, for instance, loading a taconite train at a taconite plant in northern Minnesota is a process that now takes one person to load the train. They're, they're working off of automated software. They have chutes and they, they send the uh, taconite pellets down into the train. And while there are other support personnel around, it, this job that used to take hundreds of people now, now takes one. We're now looking at you know, the idea that what do people do when we just don't need as many people to do the physical tasks anymore? Uh, how will we reorient our lives and our economy so that everybody is valued and 
has a, a role to play in a society, it's going to it's going to challenge um, not just our economy, but our culture and our understanding of of what we're supposed to do to be a good and productive citizen. We just got the news this week that the Minnesota State Supreme Court will be uh, reviewing uh, parts, very specific parts of the PolyMet uh, permits. Uh, PolyMet is a copper nickel, a proposed copper nickel mine near Hoyt Lakes, near the former LTV steel taconite plant. Um, and, and I'd say the, the significant uh, aspect here is the fact that they, they are sending back for some review of the original permits, the original um, study that went into the permits, uh, you know, because this is a process that's been in the, in the works for 20 years, as many know, and there's a lot of frustration about that fact. But I'd point out that the, I think the one thing to really take away here is that when PolyMet back then was proposing its first permits, um, it, it took a lot of shortcuts in how it put it out. They didn't specify a lot of information where possible it left it fairly open and vague now they did that for a reason they did that to attract investment they did that to not pigeonhole future investors into a very specific cost specific plan but the flip side of that now is that a lot of questions that were unanswered might need to be answered before before they can um you know use those permits and and access that um those ore resources One of the interesting things about the Bob Dylan story in Hibbing is the way that despite what you hear sometimes from locals who are not a fan of Dylan or, or who think that Dylan's not a fan of them, um, is that Bob Dylan was significantly shaped by his upbringing in Hibbing and on the Iron Range. Uh, this is pretty evident from his own words, his own writing. And, uh, and if you follow, if you actually read and follow those things, you'll note that he speaks fondly of growing up in Hibbing, but also poetically of the influence of a, of a dying iron mining town. Because at the time, it, you know, it wasn't taconite yet. It was just the natural ore that was beginning to give out. And so he had a very specific set of experiences. And as I point out, this, this set of experiences made Bob Dylan who he is. He's an international star. And that attracted the attention um, in, in the last couple of decades of a young man in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, Kenya, in the capital, and who was a, who was a singer songwriter, uh, a poet of his own making, um, a guy named J.S. Andara. And Andara, uh, as he goes by as a performer, came to America. And when he had a choice of where to go, he wanted to come to the home place of his uh, icon, his, his hero, Bob Dylan which means that he went from Nairobi, Kenya to Minneapolis and, uh, and settled into the folk and music scene there. Uh, and he is coming to Hibbing, uh, to Bob Dylan's home stage this, this Saturday, uh, April 23rd, uh, on the stage of the Hibbing High School Auditorium for a free concert. Well, if you love quirky and unusual history, WDSE's new documentary series is for you. Minnesota Historia is our new digital first series, which drops its first episode next week. Here to tell us more is Mike Schultz, the producer, writer, and editor of Minnesota Historia, and Haley Eidenschenk is a museum professional and host of the series. Thank you both for being here tonight. Appreciate it very much. So Mike, what is Minnesota Historia all about? Well, it, you did a great job introducing this. It's really telling some of those quirky and unusual, often untold stories um, from Minnesota history. And I think a great way to talk about it is to give examples of some of the programs that we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about the legend of St. Urho. Uh, we're going to be talking about the root beer lady. We're going to be talking <laughs> about uh, some, some top five superior shipwrecks that aren't the Edmund Fitzgerald. So lots of untold nuggets. Haley, is, is Minnesota particularly quirky in its history, or I um, think could any, so. any region do this? Well, I think any region could, um, but Minnesota kind of leans into like the quirky fun stuff. Uh -huh. um, I think we, we think of ourselves as like kind of 
weird. Um, so we, we dig into the weird stuff a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, where do all these ideas come from? Do you, the two of you come up with this or does it public help? Yeah. Mostly Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he bounces stuff off of me. I have a um, but yeah, I have a thick file of weird stories and I just keep track of uh, interesting you know, uh, historical anecdotes that I hear and then I try to develop them into documentaries whenever I can. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a little clip of one about Duluth's bid for the Winter Olympics. So let's watch that and then we'll talk about it. Who hosted the 1932 Winter Olympics? Don't look it up on Wikipedia, you'll ruin the surprise. But here's a hint, it wasn't Duluth, Minnesota. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to the history of Duluth's doomed Winter Olympics. Oh. Hello there. On January 10, 1929, the Duluth Herald reported city leaders in Duluth were making a bid for the 1932 Olympics. And why not? Duluth has snow, it has ice, it has some hills, especially when compared to other cities in the state. But, and I am just playing devil's advocate here, are those hills big enough? If you average the elevations of our peaks and valleys, we're actually the fifth flattest state in the country. We're flatter than Kansas. Let that sink in for a second. Flatter than Kansas. I don't expect you to give it all away, but tell a little bit more, flesh this one out a little bit. Well, so as, as you may have heard, Duluth tried to get the Winter Olympics back when there weren't that many sports requiring elevation. And so we'll get into that. I mean, it actually was possible that Duluth could have hosted this thing. The only thing they needed a hill for was the bobsled. But, you know, cross-country skiing and hockey, you don't need hills for unless you're doing it wrong. And so, uh, 32 was kind of the last year that Duluth could have conceivably hosted it because then the very next year they had downhill skiing and, and luge starts, you know, uh, things like that start coming. So they, they had a very short window of time where Duluth might have been able to host it. Um, and that's now closed hard. Haley, what's it like working on this series, and how did you get interested in history? So it's been a, it's been a blast. It's like nothing I've uh, ever done before. <laughs> I got to read off a teleprompter for the first time and not just like memorize 30 second bits. Um, I've basically been into history forever. Um, like my dad would watch like World War II documentaries. Um, I was very fortunate. My parents took me to the British Museum when I was in high school, and I saw the Rosetta Stone in real life, um, and that's like my oh, this stuff is like real. Uh, moment um, and it just made me feel like really connected. But there's a lot of quirkiness out there isn't there? Yeah yeah I also am a weirdo um, so I <laughs> like history I like uh, weird history um, and there's there's a lot of it that we have to get into we we touch on a lot of it um, but there's there's much more that we don't discuss in, the, in this series. There, there's so much information available trying to capture people's attention these days. Um, do you think the, that this is a, a good way to maybe just spark some interest in history that people wouldn't have otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to use the word tricking. We're not really tricking people into watching <laughs> things, but we are definitely using like some quirky stories from history to pull people in, and then we're trying to give them a, more of a, of a context of, of broader history in the region. So we do like the legend of St. Urho, which is this quirky uh, made-up story about a, a patron saint of Finland. But then we, we use that and, and actually talk to people about, well, what were conditions like for Finnish immigrants at that time and mm -hmm. it was kind of tough for some of them then. Mm -hmm. Mike, is this is a digital only series, so what does that mean? Well, so each episode is going to premiere starting Tuesday, April 26th, uh, 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 weekly on YouTube. So you'll get a new episode every every Tuesday for the next six weeks. Um, once once they've all premiered, I believe they are going to air on WDSE during a pledge drive. So uh, if people don't have a computer, I guess you can watch it on TV <laughs> eventually. Wonderful. Haley, you, you work down at the depot and, and you help put together history tours down there. Is this really a different animal for you in, in terms of just the way you're able to approach it in a, in a fun and fresh way? Or do you try to bring a little bit of that uh, to the depot as well? So um, it's really similar. Um, I'm doing a lot less research for this. Mike has really taken care of that. But for the depot stuff, I. I mean, I have fun doing it, so I try to like make it fun. I've always found that like the people who don't really like history, it's because they don't like facts, they don't like numbers, they don't like dates and like memorizing things. But stories are interesting to everyone. Um, so this is just 
instead of a tour story, it's a, it's a video story. Mm -hmm. you know, people don't watch television like they, like they used to, where they sit down at a you know, set time and you know, plan their night around the, the television schedule. Is it important, do you think, for stations like WDSE to really um, deliver content in, in new ways to kind of reach those new audiences where they're at today? Yeah, I do think it's important. It's been really fun to work on this project for me because I am more accustomed to, you know, a documentary for a film festival or for, or for TV. It is a slightly slower pace. And so this, we're really ramping up the pace and including, you know, more images per minute. And, uh, and Haley's a little bit funnier, I think, on <laughs> YouTube than she would be if we were doing it for TV. And so it looks like it's for all age groups. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep, I think so. It's for it's for everybody. I mean, history's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And now, could this go beyond the the initial six episodes? Or? Well, yeah, I have a ve like I said, I have a very thick file. <laughs> so I mean, I am ready to go into multiple seasons of this, and I Wonderful. may just start doing them on my own. That's I mean, they're fun. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's really a fun series, and we're excited to be part of it here. Thank you both. Thank you. All right. Well, that's our time for now, but you can keep up with our show by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Then visit the WDSC website for program updates, news about the station, and upcoming events. And download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. And Denny, maybe this uh, weekend's rain is going to get us thinking of spring? Get your bumper shoot out. You'll need it. <laughs> what on earth is a bumper shoot? Umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> I learn something every week. <laughs> Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.